Hello cave dwellers and welcome back to the third and final installment of our C64 refurbishment, a machine generously donated to the cave, which was something of a hybrid with mismatched board and case serial numbers, so we took the opportunity to combine old with new, an old system board with a new case, and we've applied the usual TLC to the system. So today we hope to finish up a few snags and then we can get down to the business of using it, as well as enjoying a modern twist. The first snag to deal with is of course the keys. Now they're not all that yellowed, but in contrast to our brand new case which we fitted in part 2, it quickly becomes evident that they're a different shade. Only slightly, but it's enough to bug me. We also discovered that to fit the keyboard into the case, we needed some keyboard mounts supplied by Pixel Wizard, the same supplier of the case itself, and they finally arrived. The brackets are 3D printed, and they're definitely not poor quality, this is a thick piece of plastic that doesn't bend and should hold that keyboard solidly in place. Jan Beter has joined us throughout the series, and in the last part he gave us some advice about the power supply and the dangers of a rogue 5 volt line, which often crops up with these C64 supplies, and will fry the computer entirely. The solution is a device that sits between the power supply and the computer, and immediately cuts the flow of power if a fault is found on the 5 volt line, and that's what we have here. I purchased this one from Australia, it cost me about £26, including postage, and despite the 3D printed case, it's a very professionally put together little board on the inside. These kinds of devices are made by hobbyists, and there are many about, it just depends who's making them at the time as to their availability, and this is the one I could get my hands on. I'll include a link in the description. So if we're going to take these keys up a shade, we need to take them off the keyboard again, of course using our keycap puller. The more observant of you in the last episode noticed that there was a mistake when I put the keys back together, and it was to do with the springs. All of the springs are the same size on the C64 keyboard, with the exception of the spacebar which found its way under the P key. Here it is, you can see that it's slightly larger than all of the others. So of course we'll put that back in the right place now. Nothing gets by you guys, does it? You really do spot everything. Regular viewers will of course know my predicament in the UK with retro brighting and the lack of sunshine. The grey British weather really doesn't make for easy retro brighting, and so I'm determined to find new ways to do it. This seemed like the perfect opportunity to try one of those ways that I've been reading about recently, and that's a submersion method. Ordinarily we use a cream peroxide, coat it liberally on the parts and then cover it in cling film so that it doesn't dry out, and just pop it out in the sun and it goes to work, and we've had some very good results that way. Our method today then is to use this Superstar 40 volume crystal clear peroxide, and what we're going to do is follow some advice that I was given, which is to make a 50-50 solution with water, heat it in a pan, and then cook your keycaps in it for a good four to five hours. The temperature I'm aiming for is 70 degrees or just below, and as we got underway, I soon realised my first mistake. With no lid for this pan, the liquid will naturally evaporate as it's heated up, reducing the volume and therefore the amount of energy needed to heat it. So on a number of occasions, while I wasn't paying attention, the temperature did creep up to nearly 80 degrees. I countered this by reducing the heat and topping up the solution with more of the peroxide and water. So lesson one. Get a pan with a lid on it. Four hours later and our cookery class was complete. That's just water in the pan now, I have rinsed them of the peroxide. Now I'm not claiming a major victory here, but I am pleased with the results. It has taken the keys up the shade that I wanted them to be. And that's evident when I compare them to the new case. We've just about got the right colour match now. However, my neglect of the temperature didn't go without penalty. Here's our spacebar key, 
and it certainly didn't like touching 80 degrees. Or maybe it did. I'm not sure if it's smiling or frowning. Either way, it's anything but straight now, and no amount of persuasion was about to fix that. In every mistake there are lessons to be learned, so what can we take from this one? Well firstly, I'm clearly not the first to suffer this fate. Here are some pictures from Twitter user Leftover Beefcake, and his keyboard really did suffer from neglecting the temperature in this process. Just look at those. So what should we do? Well firstly I'm not going to make you wait for another episode just for a spacebar. Here's one I prepared earlier. And such is my need to learn from these mistakes and to refine this process that in the next few weeks I'm going to dedicate an entire episode just to fine tuning it. And I have the perfect donor in this Amiga 500. We don't need to run another trash to treasure on an A500 but those keys and the case need some looking after. So it's the perfect machine for a retro writing episode and you can expect that soon on the channel. Now let's push on with our C64. Our Pixel Wizard brackets fit neatly in the Pixel Wizard case. Well you'd expect them to really, he wouldn't be much of a wizard if they didn't. The lid goes on, and well we're nearly complete. Some of you also pointed out in the last episode that it bugged you that the sticker was different on the new case, and yes it bugged me too. So it was out with the heat gun to remove the old sticker and see if we can't do something about that. With the sticker carefully removed and the glue still hot, I was able to pop it straight onto the new case. Now how's this for a finishing touch? It appears the old sticker still had the protective film over the top of it, so I was able to peel it off and our old sticker was just like new. As is now, the whole C64. And so now it's finally time to plug it in and get some use out of our new Commodore. Let's take it through to the other side of the cave. Our C64 is gleaming, it looks and feels like a brand new machine. And thanks to the new capacitors and heat sinks we fitted, it should remain that way for a long time to come. The first game I ever played on a C64 was called Beachhead. It just so happened to be what a relative had when I went to visit them and they showed me the machine for the first time. And we loaded it from cassette. Here's our cassette deck. We saw it in episode 1 and yes it's still in a terrible state. It would need a whole episode in itself to refurbish it, but I thought I'd give it a go and see if we can get something to load. In the UK this would have been the most common method of using the C64, which often causes discussion, particularly with our friends in the States, who seem to more commonly have the disk drive. Our first test to load data into the machine and actually play something, an abject failure and it came with the smell of a burning motor. Something just isn't right with this cassette deck, and I'm not going to tempt fate any further and risk damaging it or the C64. So the cassette deck goes to one side, and let's move on to the next method, cartridges. With a slot built right into the C64, cartridges were the easiest and quickest way to load programs into the machine, but they came at a cost. Selling for double as opposed to the single digit figures you would find for cassette tapes and sometimes discs. But some people were happy to pay for the instant loading. And we'll try our first cartridge which is a modern diagnostic cartridge, which will also give us an insight into the chips on the machine and if they're all okay.
There are a few diagnostic cartridges on the market, this particular one comes from sharewareplus.com. It works its way through the machine, checking each chip and telling us if there are any problems. We don't need to be too concerned about these ones that are showing up as bad, because to complete those tests you need a loopback harness. That is a cable that plugs into the C64, out and then plugs back into itself so it can physically perform checks on ports, for example the serial port, which you just can't test without a cable. So loopback checks excluded, our C64 actually checks out fine and everything is good. Let's try that other cartridge, Jungle Hunt. Our first game then and it loads up and plays just fine, so I'm confident that our C64 has no problems. The only problem is that this is a bit of a terrible game. It was released in 1982 by Atari and it offers very little in the way of graphics, sound or indeed gameplay. C64 games came a lot better than this. So let's move on to our next method of loading programs and see if we can hunt some down. In this box we have the 1541 5 and a quarter inch disk drive. A facelifted version 2 of the drive was also available which was more in keeping with the style of the C64C. This matches the older bread bin, and it's an absolute monster. Checking the manual, it measures in at 97mm high by 200 by 374 deep. To put that into some kind of perspective, here it is lined up against the machine, and it's as long as the C64 is wide. It may just be a peripheral, just a disk drive, but the 1541 is iconic in itself in its styling. It has such a classic retro computer look, especially with that rainbow logo on the front, I absolutely love it. And what I love even more is that it actually works. I've loaded Operation Wolf here, Tato's on rails arcade shooter, and the precursor to Operation Thunderbolt. And after a quick blast of shooting down helicopters, soldiers, and trying to avoid shooting the nurses and causing any more problems at the National Health Service, it was with great anticipation that I could finally load a Calabeth World of Doom. Now if I had the original Apple II release, this would be worth a small fortune, but this is a re-release from 2016, in fact I don't think it was ever released on the C64 originally. I bought it as a special edition, this one's number 37, and I've never actually been able to play it because I didn't have a C64 until now. And now Richard Garriott's World, the predecessor to the Ultima series, one of my favourite of all time, is open for me to enjoy and explore on this five and a quarter inch floppy. So this is all well and good, I'm enjoying my floppy disks, my tape drive doesn't work, and so far I've been lucky with the media I have, although as time goes by, these discs and those tapes, should I get a working tape drive, will degrade and become unplayable. So how about a modern solution? This is the SD to IEC from the company The Future Was 8-Bit and it's glorious. It takes its style in from the 1541, gives you the simplicity and speed of the disk drive with the capacity of an SD card and it even supports multi-disc games by using the buttons on the top there to scroll through your selected mounted disk. Power for the device is drawn from the cassette port and then it plugs into the serial port just as the 1541 would. On its own, the SD to IEC is a must-have add-on for any C64 owner, at least in my opinion anyway. But long-time users of the C64 will remember something extra you could buy, the Epix fast load cartridge, and as luck would have it, the future was 8-bit also sell a modern version of this cartridge. A cartridge that increases the speed of the disk drive and therefore the SD to IEC here by five times, loading most programs in under eight seconds. As per the original Epix cartridge, it introduces shortcut key commands to the system. For example, I can press Commodore Run Stop to instantly load the disk. In the case of the SD to IEC, that loads the interface on which you can select your game. And here is that interface. It's easy to navigate using a joystick in joystick port 2, and you can just scroll through the folders to find the file that you want to mount. What you're seeing here is unedited footage of the game loading in real time, so you can see just how quickly it loads. And it will be briefly followed by me playing the game absolutely terribly.
C64C then, with these peripherals, make it my perfect Commodore setup. I would like to visit the bread bin in future and look at some of those older revision boards, but this will keep me more than entertained for a long time to come. I did turn to you guys and also to Jan Beta for some suggestions on what your favourite games are and what I should play with my new computer. So here are Jan's suggestions, and while he's talking, I've scrolled your suggestions along the bottom of the screen. Hello, cave people. It's uh, Jan Beta, and the best three Commodore 64 games are impossible to be named because there's just so many brilliant Commodore 64 games. Um, I decided to choose my favorites from back in the day, uh, the games I played the most as a kid. One of them has to be River Raid, uh, which you can see in the background here. Uh, I loved it. It's a brilliant shooter um, by Carol Shaw. And the second one probably was Buggy Boy, which I still love on the Commodore 64. I basically it's for me it's the best version of the game ever and the one i played the most by far has to be the great Diana sisters uh, which is a knockoff of super mario brothers and um, nintendo sued rainbow arts who published the game back in the day um and they had to take it off the market but it got pirated so often that it was um, a hit with kids back then one of the best jump and run games ever, in my opinion. Um, it had some flaws because they rushed it, but uh, there's brilliant gameplay. Uh, the music is brilliant, one of Chris Hultzbeck's first uh, major projects, I think. And yeah, it's just a brilliant game, I loved it. And uh, one of the few games I played through to the end. So check that out. Thanks for having me. Have fun with your Commodore 64. See you soon, bye. Between you and Jan, a whole library of new games has opened up to me, and if you'll excuse me, I'm off to explore them now. I hope you enjoyed the fun we had with the C64C in this series, and as always, if you did, give the video a like, subscribe to the channel, and if you really liked it, consider becoming a patron to support future content. You can find all links in the description below. Thanks for watching, Cave Dwellers. Take care. Music